How's everybody doing? Good? Awesome. We were kind of teasing a little bit back there in the room, and I was saying the small guy among the three of us is Pastor John. Lauren is smaller, and I'm the smallest. To make it backward, I'm tall, and Lauren is taller. Pastor John is the tallest guy. Lauren will do the opening prayer and will we'll pray for Pastor John before we begin. And so at this time, I want to thank Eric once again for playing that big instrument for us. Let's give him a hand once again. Good job, Eric. Thank you very much. We also would like to welcome our viewers on Good News TV, wherever you are, at home or everywhere. We'd like to uh, want to thank you for joining us and deciding to uh, plug in on and be online and join us in this session. So uh, Lauren is uh, actually an elder of the Chandler Film Church uh, over in Chandler. He will do the opening prayer and a special prayer for Pastor John. Lauren. If you are able to stand, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in prayer. Otherwise, you may remain seated. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving God, our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that at this hour we can still come together to listen to a very important topic. We have gathered here, we have quite a number of people who are willing to listen, as well as those who are live streaming and listening in Good News TV. May you bless all of us that as we listen to Pastor John, you will use him to remind us that one of the greatest needs, according to Spirit of Prophecy right now, is for a church to be revived. And I also remind us, dear Heavenly Father, that there are two forms of revival, pseudo-revival and real spiritual transformation. Heavenly Father, as we listen, please use Pastor John to remind us that true spiritual revival is our greatest need. And when we are revived, we will make disciples of all nations, tongues, and people. Heavenly Father, please use us and make us truly revived so that we will be discipling our church and beyond. We love you, Lord. This we ask and pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Ron and Lauren. I appreciate that. We are prayed up. Something that we need for listening ears, amen? And so my prayer is uh, united with Lauren's in that this morning, as we take the next step in what a disciple-making church looks like and how that can revive the church in very important days as we seek to share that final gospel message to all the world. Um, I've got today at least uh, more of a... Here, let me get this set up correctly. There we go. If you remember from our last meeting, for those of you who were there, I made this statement to begin with. And you can maybe help me finish this. If this church did discipleship right, evangelism would largely take care of itself. God's plan to reach all people with the everlasting gospel is the same today as it was in ancient days. His well-designed plan to use his chosen people to accomplish this mission has not changed. We serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe that he is still calling his disciples to follow his leading as his church to bring the everlasting gospel to all the world. And so those are the things we were covering yesterday. Today, we're going to take a little different uh, approach. We're going to move, we're going to fast forward from ancient times and that bridge, of course, that we saw yesterday between the, the children of Israel and the church of Israel. And we're going to look at what Jesus said about discipleship and what it means to be a disciple, a follower of him. 
So I've entitled the talk today, Jesus and the Twelve. Tim Dearborn once said, it is insufficient to proclaim that the church of God has a mission in the world. Rather, the God of mission has a church in the world. Do you see the different perspective there? We often say that, hey, we've got a mission to accomplish. But I've come to prefer, according to Tim and his statement here, I prefer this idea that the God of mission has a church in the world and I want to unite with his church in spreading the gospel to all the world. Jesus has positioned his church, the Seventh-day Adventist church in these last days, in the middle of a vast wheat field, one that must be harvested before Jesus comes. The task looks impossible. I mean, have you looked at the size of the cities today? Have you looked at the population of the world today? Six plus billion people. It seems to me that this is an impossible task. How can a harvest of that size be possibly be even achieved? Well, the question is not so much how we can get the work done. That is a human-centered perspective. The right question is, how can we align, better align ourselves with God's evangelistic design for his church so that he can effectively use it to accomplish his mission? And you see how I carefully chose those words? This is Christ's mission. He has a church in the world. He designed it to reach the world. How can we better align the structure of our church, the organization of our church, the mission of our church? How can we better align it with his plan so that he might use it for his glory? You see, Jesus was very clear about his mission. He came to do what? To seek Save who? Those who are lost. One of my favorite passages in Scripture takes place in the upper room. Now, if you've read your Bibles from about, oh, John chapter 13 to John 17, you realize that he devoted a significant portion of his gospel to the upper room. That's a lot of, those are a lot of chapters, five chapters on the upper room. Well, we know that that event took place on the night before his crucifixion. Jesus is meeting with his disciples. He's spending time breaking bread with them. And he's given them some very key teachings, some important lessons for them to learn. Because in some respects, this is his last will and testament. He knows what's going to happen that very night where he will be taken captive and brought before the Sanhedrin. And I believe also that his words are important for understanding what he's asking for not only his disciples, the 12 at the time, that had been reduced to 11, of course. We know Judas was the one that, uh, that betrayed Christ. But some important lessons for them and for us still today are found in these chapters. And the favorite passage of those is John chapter 14, at least for me. And we're going to spend some time on a portion of that chapter here this morning. John 14, starting with verse 12, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Now, what works, what possible works do you think Jesus was referring to at that uh, with the disciples there in the upper room. His works to do what? What was his mission? To, to seek and to save the lost. Then he goes on and he says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. 
Now, I'm going to stop there for just a minute because as you can see, Jesus is making a clear transition from the works that I will, I've done, you will now do greater works than these. And then he makes the statement that if you ask anything of me, if it will glorify my Father in heaven, I'll do it. And then he transitions and uses this word. Some translations use the word comforter. Uh, I like the New King James Version because the context reveals really what he's intending to convey here, which is Jesus is saying, I will give you a helper. I will give you someone who will help you do the works that I started and that you will continue. Because without this helper, you cannot finish the work. And this helper, he says, will abide with you forever. Who was he speaking of? The helper. Well, let's read on. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you, present tense, and will be where? In you, future tense. Now, that's interesting. Jesus says that the helper that has come, first of all, he dwells with you. He's been working on you. He's been drawing you. He's been doing everything he can to connect you with me. But one day in the near future, he will be what? In you. What was he talking about? What was Jesus speaking of as to the great event that would happen not too long after that? Pentecost. Well, the Holy Spirit came down and filled the disciples with Christ's presence. And I say Christ's presence because look at verse 18. Jesus brings, he, he takes the topic of the helper and brings it back to him, saying, I will not leave you orphans, but what? I will come to you. So when the Holy Spirit comes into your life as a disciple, Whose presence abides in you? Jesus. Here's how critical this point is. Just a simple kind of deduction. Jesus, when he came to this earth in the likeness of men, he gave up something very, very essential to himself, an important aspect of himself, a characteristic. And that was his omnipresence, his ability to be everywhere at one time because he came like a man. We cannot be everywhere and he identified so much with us that he had to give up that characteristic as God. An incredible sacrifice. But now through the helper, the Holy Spirit, he can be in each and every one of his disciples. And so this is why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit working in your life. Because when the Holy Spirit's there, Jesus is there. Many times I've heard people say to me, you know, I've been really busy for God. And this is the idea that comes out that I'm, I'm working for God. And we, you know, on the surface, it's a good thing to work for God, isn't it? But somehow I think that we're missing one essential piece of this Holy Spirit present Christ in us element. If we simply just say that, okay, well, we're working for God. Because in reality, what Jesus was saying here was that when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, the works that I began, will now, I will now do in and through you so that greater works can be done. Not by you, but by me working through you. You see the difference? You see, discipleship isn't just something that, okay, I'm going to do for God. I'm going to stay committed to God. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to keep his commandments. And I'm going to do great things for him. It's all about, Jesus, take my life. I'm your disciple. Put your spirit within me, and now use me for whatever purpose you see fit. So more than we, us working for God, Jesus is working through his spirit through us to not only transform our lives, but to, trans, to, to reach and touch people around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Our job then is to cooperate with him, to let him work. Notice this from Christ Object Lessons, page 142. Our mission to the world is not to serve or please ourselves. We are to glorify God by doing what? Cooperating with him to save sinners. You see, Jesus left no questions about his intention for calling the disciples. Yes, he wanted to change their life, and their life changed dramatically, drastically. But more than that, he wanted to use them for spreading this wonderful message, this gospel message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And that is the reason why he's chosen us today. You might say that we're modern day disciples, but we're no different than the disciples of old. The purpose is still the same. God has called us to unite with him. Let Jesus use us to connect people to him and to reconcile the world to, to the Father. When the 12 accepted the call to discipleship, their life changed forever. I find one of the greatest temptations, at least in my own life, uh, initially, early on, was this pull to go back into what I used to do. I mean, there was no doubt. I, abs- I appreciated, I loved God for what he did for me. When I accepted Jesus, it was with no turning back. But the devil still tries hard to pull us back in and to get us distracted by the things of this world. With disciples, the disciples of old, there was no option to go back. And I like to think that with us as well, going back to the old life is just not an option. Discipleship is a lifestyle in every way. When you decide to accept Jesus as your Savior, you also made him your Lord. And what, is, what, is the, what does this idea of Lord mean? When you say someone is Lord, what is that referring to? He is an overseer of your life. Uh, in, in many respects, you don't have your life anymore. You're responsible for supporting and doing according to what the Lord has asked you to do. I think one of the things that is missing from Christianity today in general is this sanctified walk with God, this lordship of Christ. Yeah, it's, it's critical that we are justified in Christ and that he has taken us off death row and, and, and given us his righteousness and now we are declared righteous in his sight before our heavenly father and we are saved. But then what happens from there in our walk with God as a disciple? This is what discipleship is all about. And I believe that if we can somehow change the culture of our churches to grasp the magnitude of Jesus calling on our life, that revival can and will occur. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Amazing words. Sometimes I forget these and I need to go back to this and remember who I am in Jesus. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, but not just exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. With Christ as the Lord of your life, you can have giant expectations. Your life is not about what you can do any longer. It's about what Christ can do in you and through you by his grace. And this is what grace is all about. The grace of God brings endless possibilities. And I think sometimes the devil works on us to be fearful of of being a witness for God. As to somehow this, um, this is hard thing. And I think we struggle. Tomorrow we're going to talk about, uh, the title of tomorrow's talk is um, 
uh, solving the absentee conundrum, absent members, absent disciples at their post. We'll talk about, a little bit more about that so I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But do you believe that God can do anything through you if you let him? Let me read for you a, a wonderful um, picture of what our perspective can be as a disciple of Jesus every day. It comes from a gentleman named Mark Batterson. Uh, well, let me, before I get there, I was ahead of myself. Let me read this for you. It's a quote from Christ Object Lessons once again. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes what? Omnipotent. Have you ever thought of yourself as having omnipotent will? Seems almost strange or even we have to be careful to say it. But it says here, it goes on, whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings, whatever he asks us to do, are enablings. He makes us capable of doing. That's why the possibilities are endless. So we must think bigger than we do as disciples of Jesus. We must think bigger each day of what God can accomplish through us if we let his spirit work and we cooperate with him. I'll tell you what, numerous times, let me give you one story. I was walking out of my former uh, office building, this is many, many years ago, and I was, I had been talking and engaging in a conversation with a lady who ran the convenience store at Fireman's Fund Insurance Company where I worked. It was the corporate office, 2,500 employees, a large facility, and she ran the convenience store. I would go down there oh, a couple times a week to get something for the afternoon to kind of, I was dragging, and so I wanted some crackers or something like that, and I'd pick something up. But the real purpose often was I'd like to talk to her. She's very kind. We would have a good conversation. Well, one day, we were leaving the building at the same time. And as we were walking together, I heard very clearly a strong impression from God's Spirit say to me, tell her about Jesus. I mean... I, and I heard it, I knew God said it, and I got very uncomfortable. I was still fairly young in my walk with Jesus, but he was stretching my faith and he said, tell her about Jesus. And it happened again as we're walking down the road to the, to the sidewalk, to the parking lot. I was so afraid to do it, I didn't do it. And I wish I could say I spent you know, the next week thinking about it and went back and then shared Christ with her, but I didn't do it. I regret not doing it. But I think these, this is kind of an example of sometimes the call that God lays on our life and we need to just jump through it sometimes. I have no doubt in my mind that if I opened my mouth and I shared Christ with her, she would have listened. But I was too afraid. And this is something Jesus does not want us to be afraid to be disciples for him. So with this now, let's turn to Mark Batterson's quote that I mentioned before. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Set God-sized goals, pursue God-ordained passions, Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Keep asking questions. Keep making mistakes. Keep seeking God. Stop pointing out the problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Stop playing it safe and start taking risks. Expand your horizons, accumulate experiences, enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can. Live like today is the first day and the last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges, blaze new trails, criticize by creating. Worry less about what people think and more about what God thinks. Don't try to be who you're not. Be yourself. Laugh at yourself. Don't let fear 
dictate your decisions. Take a flying leap of faith, chase the lion. That, of course, comes from the story in the Bible of the lion chaser. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what the possibilities are that lie before us every day? It's just, I'm amazed at myself sometimes when I get up in the morning and I put my feet down to the floor and I just hit the ground running. I've got lots of stuff to do. Come on, I'm a pastor. There's people to see. There's a sermon to prepare. There's a teaching on Wednesday night that I've got to get ready. But what matters most is talking with God about what he wants me to do that day. Right? This is the approach to life that I believe every disciple of Jesus should have as they walk with him each and every day. Jesus spent three and a half years discipling the 12. My question for you today is why doesn't the church give more time, attention, and resources to discipling our members? If you can remember from yesterday, we defined a disciple as a learner or pupil. And we broke down into three parts what a disciple was with the statement from Jesus in Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do you remember those three components? A disciple is one who follows Christ, is being transformed by Christ, and engages in the mission of Christ. Now, I want to dive a little deeper here today. And what I want to give you is just kind of, and you might say some, some devotional food for thought so that you can apply it to your own life as a disciple of Jesus. So we're going to go a little deeper into discipleship, what it means every day, every week, month, year, as you walk with Jesus. Now, I get these, there are four things, we're going to call them four conditions of discipleship. But we're going to take these from four statements that Jesus made directly in relation to discipleship. In other words, Jesus four times in the gospel says, if you do this, you will be my disciples. Or if you do not do this, you will not be or cannot be my disciples. So only four times does he say this. And I found some amazing things after those things were pulled out of the gospels. I found some amazing, thing, amazing things that will teach us how to be a disciple each and every day. Can I share those with you? All right, here are the four things, the four conditions of discipleship. Love for God and people. Commitment to follow Jesus. Obedience to God and his word. And then lastly, to bear fruit in faithful service to God. Now let's look at the four statements. Are you ready for the four texts that go along with these? Here we go. Number one, John 13, 35. I know it's a little small up there. I apologize for that. It's hard to fit everything onto one slide. But uh, hopefully you can see that. First reference, John 13, 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you what? Have love for one another. You see, love for God and then for people is the first condition of discipleship. Without love, there can be no discipleship. Because you remember, discipleship is not about getting saved. It's about the fact that you are saved and you're now walking with Jesus each and every day. So love for God and people is seen in this statement here from Christ from John 13, 35. Let's look at the commitment to follow Jesus. What does he say about that? Luke 14. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. There it is again. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, that's, that's a tall order, isn't it? Give up everything I have? Does this mean I, I, I order a moving truck and I load it up and I just say, take it where Jesus wants it? Not really, right? I think what it means is all that you have you give up for Jesus in that you give it to Christ to use. Amen? 
And that's what he's referring to here in that we have to give everything up for him. Nothing can get in the way of our relationship, our connection to Jesus and that commitment to follow him. The next one, obedience to God and his word. This is from John 8, beginning with verse 31. It's also found, there's a part of it found in 1423. Here's what he says. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. He adds later, if anyone loves me, he will what? Keep my word. So here we find that obedience to God comes from doing what the word of God says. Did you know that the, the word of God, the Bible, is alive? That when you read it, it transforms, it changes you? The best thing you can do when you sense that you're weak and you need some strength from the Lord is to open his word and read it, to study it, and to fall in love with the God who authored it. Number four, this fourth statement that we get from Jesus to bear fruit in faithful service to God, we find in John chapter 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Do you see that qualification there, that, that, that condition of discipleship? There are four then. Love for God and people, commitment to follow Jesus, obedience to God in his word, bear, bearing fruit in faithful service to God. These to me are very helpful. Uh, I, I like to think sometimes in, um, I don't know, maybe it's too logical. My wife, Rochelle, is much different than I. She doesn't, she's logical, but that's not what drives her. <laughs> what drives her are the Psalms. Isaiah in the declaration of God's love for his people and those things. And hey, and I love that too. But what drives her and what drives me is a little different. But still, it is all stemming from our love for God. And then he gives us love for people. Now, let's go one step further with this. These four conditions, I believe, are also four steps in our walk with Jesus. So now we're not talking about our steps to be saved. That's what we defined that as yesterday. That's legalism. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about steps in our walk with Jesus. Uh, what is the book by Ellen White, one of the devotional books that's amazing? What's the title called? Steps to Christ. Well, think of these as the four steps in our walk with Jesus as a disciple. So taking the first one, the first one is love. God first loved us. It's the drawing, motivating, heart-changing power for everything we do as a disciple. And then commitment. Commitment is, is the surrender that we make. It's our choice. It's an act of the will. Lord, I give you my life. Take it. It's a decision that we make. It's sacrificial. It's a consecration to God because of the love we have for him. And then next is obedience. This is faith in practice. It's according to God's word, works of devotion, and it also happens by divine grace. You cannot obey without the power of God resigning, residing in you to give you strength to obey. And then lastly, this bearing fruit, it's a natural outflow of a selfless character. It's a new nature, it's habitual. It's a lifestyle. Now, some might be asking, because I've had this question before, so I'm just going to answer it. Pastor John, why did you define or separate commitment from obedience? Well, I separated it because God did. Jesus did. <laughs> he clearly says that we need to give up our way. We need to die to what? Self, And once that happens, the Spirit of God takes over and enables us, empowers us, strengthens us so that we might obey him in all that he asks us to do, right? And as a result of that obedience, where actually God sends us to go and what he asks us to do, we find that we are bearing fruit. And that bearing fruit involves the fruit of a changed life, someone you've connected with to disciple, 
someone you've shared the gospel with who accepts Christ as their Savior, that is fruit for God's kingdom. Again, these are steps not to salvation. These are steps because we are disciples of Jesus. And I believe this, uh, that by separating commitment and obedience, there are some lessons to learn in that. And let me just share a couple of these uh, with you. First, I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to do what? To will. A key word there, to will. Hold on to that word, the will, because we're going to talk about this in just a minute. To will and then to what? To do of his good pleasure. God works in us so that we might will, we might give our will to him, that we might do his will. And then he gives us the power to do things according to his will. We're talking about two separate things here. The Holy Spirit first works on us, then he works in us, then he works through us. I'm going to read from Steps to Christ now. The book I just mentioned, page 47. The power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to do what? To exercise. What does exercise mean? It's, it's executing a decision. It's moving, it's, it's doing, it's making a decision, right? It's theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot change yourself. Um, you cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to do what? To serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Brothers and sisters, I think we underestimate the power of the will. When I stumbled onto this, oh, six or seven years ago, I started to put this into practice. So that when temptation came, no matter how tempting it was, as God's Spirit was moving upon my heart, I would say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done, right? Isn't that kind of a daily thing that we need to be doing? Not my will. This is the handing over of your will to God. You know what? I would love to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of doing that, but I know that as a disciple of Jesus that I should not. So Lord, not my will. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to give you my will. And when we hand our will to God, he takes over. His spirit moves in us to then do what? To obey. He gives us the strength to do what is right. And I think this step of commitment, of staying committed to God as a disciple, is a huge step in allowing us to continue to have the Holy Spirit flow through us. Because if we don't go through this step of giving our will to God when temptation comes, when challenges come then we, in effect, quench the Spirit's work in our lives. And Paul very clearly says, do not quench the Spirit. Make sure you're continually giving your will to God. Now, Jesus was our example in this, wasn't he? Did he want to go to the cross? Did he want to die? But no, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Now, we're not talking about willpower. Willpower is different. We all have different degrees of willpower. I'll tell you what, I had a friend of mine that was a Navy SEAL, and he would tell me of some of the things they had to go through to become a Navy SEAL. And and as I was listening, I could could say to myself, and I knew without a doubt, I could never do that. 
I don't have enough willpower. But Jesus isn't talking about willpower. He's talking about the power of the will, of giving your will to God. And then how he responds to that act, that decision to give us, give him our will. And then he fills us with his spirit and enables us to obey when he calls. Do you see the difference? Did I explain that well? Praise God. Listen to this from Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, it's interesting here. This is the New King James Version. Look at what the reading is in the old NIV. Look at the end of this scripture. Which is your what? Your spiritual act of worship. So when you offer your body as a living sacrifice to God, living means that you're dead to sin and now you're alive to God. When you offer your body to God, that is a spiritual act of worship. It's saying, God, I choose you over what I want. Lord, take me because I want to worship you. And he sees that as an act of worship. This commitment that we make to God is death to self, but life in Christ. One pastor friend of mine said, instead of trying harder, die harder. Amen. Beautiful. From the book, The Worship Architect, Constance Cherry wrote these words. The measure of a worshiping heart is an active disciple. You see, every day of your life, you are going to, as a disciple, come under attack of the enemy. He's going to try and get you off course. But every step you take to stay committed to God and to obey him, to follow him, and then naturally, of course, through that, it's a process of bearing fruit to God. Through that process, you are worshiping him. I've discovered that when I don't feel like doing something that God asked me to do, but I do it anyway, as an act of the will, this is when God's grace flows in. And you know what I feel about how I feel about it later? I'm glad I did that. There is no greater joy than opening your mouth to witness and share with somebody else and having them receive the invitation to know Jesus and to see them go through the process of accepting him as their savior. There is no greater joy than that. Yet the devil seems to put this heavy load of fear on us to make us really uncomfortable about opening our mouth to share our faith with someone else. Don't let him do that. Allow him, allow, uh, push away the devil and allow the spirit of God to take over. Now, a, a little bit of a plug for Dr. Uh, Nedley. In a couple um, presentations ago, he mentioned that our beliefs and thoughts strongly influence our actions. Do you remember him saying that? So you might feel a certain way, but if you, by the act of the will, engage in what you believe is right, what you know is right, what you um, then will do as right, that your actions will follow, and those actions that follow are obedient to, obedience to God's commands. From John chapter 4, we read, these words from Jesus. But the hour is coming, and now is, when this true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, one of the things I take from this is that it's important to understand these steps in our walk as a disciple with, uh, uh, of Jesus. But I also want to make sure that we understand that discipleship is a walk that is in balance. And Jesus seems to definitely note here what the balance entails. A balance of spirit and what? 
truth. It's not spirit or truth. And if you were to put a scale here and you were to say, okay, I'm going to put the spirit here and I put the truth here, that scale needs to be what? Right here, dead center. An equal balance. What I'm finding today, though, in many of our churches and with many of, of, of our members, and we're very susceptible to this as Adventists because we have the truth. We are susceptible to leaning which direction? Truth. And we can tend to get a little out of balance. And to use terms, because there aren't really any other terms, you'd say that maybe churches that, over, that, that really emphasize that to the point where they're out of balance are those that are kind of right-leaning, even maybe sometimes extreme right. Of course, now with you, I was just left, right? So... But then, in reaction to that, we have the left. And they're saying, no, it's the spirit that matters. Grace and the mercy of God. Brothers and sisters, why isn't it both? Why isn't it God's grace and his mercy as we extend that to others, and then loving the truth and living the truth and his justice in our lives? Why can't it be both? Jesus says it should be both. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, with these churches, no, oh, that's kind of a liberal church. My question is, they're right in some respects. Or the answer is they're right in some respects. With those that are extreme kind of right, I say, well, they're right in some respects. Let's bring this together. Friends, the devil tries hard to divide us. And I think we need to be focused more on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and the work that he's asked us to do in spreading the gospel with the world than we do in often majoring in the minors. By the way, this isn't, even, this isn't in my notes or anything, but um, we do major in minors. Our arguments within the church churches around everywhere, are mostly over the lesser or the, the uh, you might say, um, the, the opinions or the teachings that we have that aren't necessarily the landmark or pillar truths of our faith. We're not arguing over what day the Sabbath is. We're not or arguing over what happens when you die. Well, those are settled. Those are landmarks. Those are pillar truths that are rooted and grounded that make us Adventist. But we argue over whether or not you have to be vegan. Or we argue over whether or not you should wear long pants or dresses. We argue over the little stuff and we make huge mountains out of it. I don't want to go too much further with that, but I just, that's just my, pers my observation. All right, this comes to close to the end of my presentation, but I, we've got to cover this because um, it is, the Great Commission is the key passage for every disciple. It is really the launch pad for going forward in the presentations you're going to hear for the next three days. The Great Commission. We find uh, several iterations of the Great Commission in the various Gospels, but Matthew's is most extensive. And so that's why I share Matthew's reading here from Matthew 28, starting with verse 18. You've heard this before. If you've read your scriptures, these are, this is one of the most prominent texts of the New Testament. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, what, is, what immediately as you read this, go, therefore, and make disciples, I want you to align that command, this great commission command to the church with how we do evangelism. For the most part... We've done public evangelism by sending out flyers, which cost a lot of money, right? If any of you have been in those 
uh, discussions about how much it costs to produce and mail flyers to your neighborhood, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And essentially, when we send those flyers out, we're, in, we're inviting them to do what? To come. But Jesus said, go. I had a, a friend of mine, a former elder of a church back in Fairfield. His name's Openin Giami. He is not with us any longer. Very sad, died much too early in life. But, oh, he was on fire with the gospel and just sharing it with everybody he possibly could. And he would stand up at the beginning of each church service and he would give a report on what was going on for evangelism in the, the local church at Fairfield. And here's what he would say. Jesus said, in, his, in, the, in the language of Ghana, which is where he was from, Jesus said, go. Where have you gone this past week? I remember that distinctly. Where have you gone this past week? What was he talking about? The great commission to go. Jesus' command of his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. There's a propagating principle here. This is an ongoing process. This isn't just make one disciple. This is you make disciples who then make more disciples. Jesus goes on, verse 20, teaching them. So part of disciple making is to teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to how long? To the end of the age. Now, there's some amazing things about this passage that I've learned. And I've heard over and over again, people say, well, this is the mission statement of the church. Have you heard that before? It's the church's mission statement. You know, I agree with that to a degree, but only part of what the commission says. It's not just a mission statement, it is also a job description for disciples. You see, the mission statement is go and make disciples. That's the mission statement. But then the job description takes over because Jesus explains how to go and make disciples. You go and make disciples by baptizing, by teaching, by preaching, according to Mark, Mark's gospel. So what he's doing is he's putting both um, the mission statement and the job description together, and he's telling his disciples, 11 who are left at the time of this, I want you to go out now and make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples and grow this church throughout the world. And friends, today, this is how God's church at the end of time is to finish its evangelistic work. We are to go, not just invite people to come. This passage, the Great Commission, is an echo of the first um, few verses we read from John chapter 14. When Jesus was in the upper room, he was essentially saying, you, I want you to go do this, or you, you are going to go do this. And then here in the Great Commission, he says, now go. Does that make sense? It's a little different. Before the, the crucifixion, you're going to be doing these things, greater works than you will do. I'll be with you. I'll send the Holy Spirit as your helper. Get ready. And then when Jesus, after the resurrection, came to, him, to them and gave them this commission, he said, now go and do it. From the Desire of Ages, page 822, the Savior's commission to the disciples includes some believers to the end of time. How many? All believers to the end of time. The commission, great commission given to the 11 include you and me. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work, the church was established. It's the reason why we exist. And all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. You see, the Great Commission will remain an impossible dream until our members commit to spending time taking it seriously and spending time with their master, Jesus Christ. 
It's another reason why the, the devil keeps us so busy in life. Yeah, you know, they used to tell me that computers were going to make my life, my job, much easier. I was going to get more time, personal time, to myself. Because all those things I spent doing manually, I could do with some pushes of a button. And I was going to get some time back. So how's that working for you guys? I think I was sold a bill of goods. Because I'm not finding any more time. I'm finding much less time and much more busyness. This world in itself is getting much busier. And I think it's the devil's way of getting us off track and off focus so that we're so busy we don't have time to spend with our master and our teacher, Jesus. And without spending that time with him, this gospel and us going to all the world simply will not happen. Do you remember the antidote for the Laodicean condition in Re Revelation chapter 3? First of all, you know, you are lukewarm and you think you're all this, but you're not. And then what did he say? What was the antidote? Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, Jesus says. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and have supper with him, spend time with him. And I will add this myself, and that Laodicean condition will be gone forever. The number one indicator that you are a disciple of Jesus is the time you set aside to build a relationship with him. Rochelle and I, when we got married, we actually decided to live together. That was a joke, but I guess it didn't go very well. We actually decided, after we got married, to live together. What a novel idea. Now, it could have gone where, okay, honey, we're married. Thank you very much. Hey, I'll catch you in a couple months. I've got a lot of stuff I got to do. But that wouldn't have gone so well with the relationship, would it have? You see, every relationship requires time spent with each other, whether it's a marriage or a friend. And if we're disciples of Jesus, we've got to spend time with him. And I know from personal experience that when, I'm, when I feel like I'm a little broken down, I'm a little weak, I can look back and I can realize I'm not spending as much time with Jesus as I should be spending. You know, I'm busy. As, I'm, I'm sermons to prepare, all this stuff going on, but my devotional time, I've got to make sure I give that great attention. Listen to this from Isaiah chapter 50, our last text for today. Not the last quote, but the last text. Isaiah 50, verse 4, the Lord God, now this is, these are the words of Jesus, prophetic words from the Old Testament. So listen to what Jesus is saying in regard to what will happen when he comes to this earth the first time. He says this, the Lord God has given me, that's why me is capitalized, the tongue of the learned, so that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. Jesus learned at the feet of his mother and his father and the Holy Spirit before then he began his work around the age of 30. But one of the things he learned first and foremost was to spend time morning by morning with his father. And repeatedly you find throughout the Gospels him in prayer every morning. And he is our example. And I'll tell you what, this busyness sometimes, it just gets in the way of me even. As a pastor, you'd think, okay, pastor should set the example. I need to do better. We all need to do better. Amen? at spending time with our master and savior. This is from the book, Education, page 260. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. So they're, they're setting aside some quick time to have devotions, but there's not a real communion with God that happens there. They're, they are in too great haste with hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps for a moment within the sacred precincts, 
but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, notice, with their what? With their burdens, they return to their work. Not a pause for a moment in his presence, but personal contact with Christ, to sit down in companionship with him. This is our need. My friends, I want to encourage you today, and this is really what my role is as a pastor anyway. I want to encourage you today as a disciple of Jesus to spend every morning, the beginning of the day, with Jesus. Spend more time with Jesus. Don't just know his truth, but let his spirit have his way in you. And this is where the tone is set for the day, in the morning. I spent a lot of time here at the end of this talk today on devotion time. It's because I know that as far as our members in our churches, that if you as disciples become strong and connected to Jesus, that our churches can become healthy and they can thrive and they can be ready to go wherever Jesus calls us to go. So I want to encourage you, spend time with Jesus and follow those steps Love for God, commitment to him, obeying his word, and then bearing fruit. And I know that you will find a greater experience in Christ day to day as his disciple than you've ever had before. Can you say amen? Let me pray for that. Father in heaven, thank you so much for calling us as disciples. Lord, I think sometimes our expectations in that call aren't exactly what we thought they would be. But Lord, we know that we are connected to the, the one we want to be connected to with, the one we love, that is Jesus, who has redeemed us. But Lord, help us in making Jesus the Lord of our life to spend time with him, to let his love shine in us and through us, to remain committed to you, to obey your precepts, and to bear fruit to your glory. Lord, only you can accomplish this in and through us. We can't do it, but Lord, you can do it in us. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.